a lot of ground to cover. All right. In 2019, the Davenport House Museum brought a 19th century hair album to the Northeast Document Conservation Center for assessment, conservation, and digitization. The Sarah Davenport album contained an unusual surprise, locks of human hair that Sarah had collected from her family and tied into the book using silk ribbons. Due to the presence of this hair, which was slightly brittle and often detached from the support leaves, as well as the need to preserve the artifactual value of the volume, this project required drawing upon elements of textile, objects, and book conservation to find a workable solution. Victorians often used human hair from friends and family to create wreaths and jewelry, commonly referred to as hair work. In a time before photography, a piece of hair was the only tangible way to remember someone and hair wreaths and jewelry were often created as an act of mourning. Hair albums, on the other hand, were often assembled using locks of hair from living friends and family and more closely relate to friendship albums. Locks of hair were styled according to the abilities of the album creator, ranging from simple bunches to elaborate braided and looped creations. The Davenport House Museum, located in Savannah, Georgia, was built by local master builder Isaiah Davenport in the early 19th century as a home for himself, his wife Sarah, and their 10 children. Sarah Davenport was gifted this album in 1829 by a friend. Sarah's book has more focus on mourning than is usual for hair albums, possibly because the album was given to her in the same year that her mother died. The album contains handwritten poems and anecdotes on memory, mortality, faith, youth, beauty, and love, and locks of hair from her children, their spouses, and her grandchildren, which she arranged by birth order and family unit in the album. By 1829, Sarah had already experienced significant loss, including her husband, three of her children, her maternal grandmother, mother, and father, the album contains locks of hair from these family members who predeceased the creation of the album, in some cases by decades. So it is clear that Sarah had been collecting hair long before she ever thought to assemble it in one place. The hair album was given a thorough assessment prior to forming a treatment plan. The volume consisted of a full leather binding with blind and gold tooling on the boards and spine. There were several structural issues with the binding including a detached front board and broken sewing in the first two sections. This damage was caused by text block distortion due to the addition of locks of hair in the first three sections. The text block consisted of sections of handmade paper, uh, mach handmade machine paper sewn through the fold, sorry, machine made paper, not handmade, sewn through the fold onto two recessed cords. There were manuscript entries throughout the text block and locks of hair were tied with silk ribbons to the text block through slits in the support leaves. The silk ribbons were brittle and fractured and as a result, many of the locks of hair were detached from the text block. Historic hair tends to get more brittle as it ages and these 200 year old locks were no exception. Some were broken at their attachment point where the thread or ribbon tied around the hair had created a single compression point which bore the brunt of the mechanical strain. Several support leaves were torn or had losses at the attachment slits, again as a result of the hair straining at a single point. Some hair locks had even separated over time, as seen here. I discovered during examination that some support leaves contained a white colored powder Given the Victorians' fondness for treating natural history specimens with arsenic, mercury, and lead, I didn't want to take the risk of unknowingly exposing myself to a hazardous material. The powder served no artifactual purpose. It was located only on blank support leaves between the leaves containing hair. So I chose to remove the powder using a HEPA filter vacuum in our fume hood. This reduced the risk of cross-contamination from the volume, but did not eliminate it 
so I continued to wear PPE throughout the remainder of the treatment process. After a thorough surface cleaning, I lifted the leather on the boards and spine to facilitate the eventual reback and also improve access to the spine for cleaning. The spine was cleaned with a 4% methyl cellulose poultice. Because the backboard and the spine leather were still attached, I masked these areas off with melanex to avoid damaging the leather. Once the spine was cleaned, I removed the first two sections, which were already loose and almost entirely detached. I guarded the spine folds, mended tears and support leaves, and also mended tears and filled losses at the previous points of attachment. The stabilization of the hair locks was the most difficult part of the conservation process. I needed to decide whether it was safe to remount the hair and also whether doing so was appropriate for the album and the client's needs. The album had a significant amount of artifactual value stemming from Sarah's careful arrangements of the hair, and it would lose most of its meaning if the hair locks were removed and stored separately. Many of the hair locks had already gone missing over time and reattachment would help prevent further loss. However, the hair was too brittle to simply reattach by tying ribbons through the slits in the support leaves. And many of the support leaves had torn because of this original attachment method anyway. I conducted a thorough literature search, but there was no direct precedent that I could use for guidance. After talking to two textile conservators, Camille Myers Breeze and Morgan Bly Carbone of Museum Textile Services, about how they stabilize fragile textiles, I learned that they stitched the original materials between a backing layer of polyester woven textile and an upper layer of nylon thermoset net using an ultra fine polyester thread. I also read several articles on historic wigs and wig conservation and felt that there was a strong historical precedent of securing hair by stitching it onto textiles. Before attempting this method with the historic locks of hair, I experimented with the technique to ensure that it worked and that it was safe for the hair. I couldn't get a hold of real human hair, so I used hair silk, which looks and feels similar. During testing, I discovered that the thermoset net was visually distracting when laid on top of the hair. I also discovered that the fine woven polyester backing layer was very prone to fraying and that I'd have to use the heat or I'd have to use heat to seal the edges after sewing. I was reluctant to get a heated tool too close to the historic hair. The thermoset net, on the other hand, did not fray when trimmed, making it an ideal backing layer. Nylon can be a controversial choice of textile. There is evidence that it degrades when exposed to light. In this case, the netting would be covered by hair in the closed pages of a book, which would then be stored in a custom drop spine cloth covered box. Light exposure to the volume long term would be minimal, so it was decided to proceed with the nylon textile since it offered the most support while minimizing visual impact. There were two identical locks of detached brown hair on this page, one tied with a pinkish beige silk ribbon and one larger curl of hair. When examining the support leaf where these two locks of hair were located, it was discovered that one name had had hair attached in two places underneath the name, which was unusual for the volume. The left-hand attachment slot had an unbroken knot of brown thread in it. It was thought that the hair broke at the second attachment point, leaving the curl of hair attached and also unbound by thread. The right-hand attachment slit had a loss in the paper, which explains why the silk ribbon was still attached to the other lock of hair. It was de decided to stitch these two locks of hair onto one piece of textile, since there was strong evidence that they belonged together. The netting needed to be held at an even tension so that the hair wouldn't pucker after stitching, but lie flat. An embroidery hoop would have stretched the net too much, causing uneven tension when released. Instead, I used a window mat cut out of black mat board. A small square of net was attached to the mat board using painter's tape. The tape held the textile flat with minimal tension so that it would not contract when released. The painter's tape could be removed relatively easily so that both mat and tape could be reused. 
this minimized waste materials. The thermoset net and Gutterman Scala polyester thread recommended by Camille and Morgan came in a variety of colors and both net and thread were selected to match each lock of hair by color. Once the netting was attached, I flipped the board over so that the hair could nestle inside the recess of the window mat. I tied a simple square knot around one thread of nylon net using the polyester thread. After the hair was placed, I arranged it so that the curl of the lock fell in the most natural position. Any strands of hair sticking out from the lock were tucked back in. I wanted to avoid compression points where hair could possibly break over time, so I kept the tension of the thread loose and also made the stitches large to spread any strain over a larger surface area. The technique that worked best was to thread the stitch through several layers of hair at varying depths. This method held the hair in place while leaving very little of the stitch visible. Once sewing was complete, the thread was tied to the tail of the thread from the initial knot, and both were threaded through the nylon net before trimming the ends. The net was then trimmed as closely as possible to the hair. The hair was gently held back by a micro spatula or flat edge tweezers to keep it away from the scalpel blade. The inner circle of the hair lock was trimmed first, followed by the outer edge of the lock to maintain net tension and avoid hair movement. After sewing and trimming, the net and thread were almost invisible underneath the hair. The textile and thread were quite a bit more distracting from the back, but luckily will not be viewed from this angle. Once all of the hair had been stabilized, I determined the lock's original locations within the album. For example, there were two detached locks of hair from Hugh Hollock Davenport and Hugh McCall Davenport on the same page. Fortunately, the support leaves were stained in the exact shapes of these locks, making identification possible. UV imaging was also useful for determining hair lock locations when discoloration was not obvious under natural light. UV imaging also conclusively proved that locks of hair had gone missing from the album at some point in time. The album contained a number of names with no associated hair or immediately apparent staining. There were slits in the paper underneath the names, clearly made in preparation for mounting hair, but no definitive evidence that the hair had ever actually been there. Under UV light, many of these apparently blank support leaves suddenly showed visible areas of discoloration where hair locks had previously been attached. Although the hair samples are now missing, this tells us that the hair was lost after they'd been attached for a long period of time. The hair was reattached to the support leaves using slips of Japanese Kozo paper lightly toned with acrylics. The paper slip was attached to the nylon thermoset net by sewing a little strip of additional net over the paper to the hair support netting. A couple of stitches went through the paper slip to help better secure it. Once stitched, the edges of the support, the paper slip were already woven into the already existing slits of paper in the support leaves. This particular lock was positioned based on the orientation of the text in and around it. The paper slips were adhered with wheat starch paste above and below the slit in the support leaf to avoid straining the fragile slit. While all of the large locks of hair were able to be reattached to the support leaves, a number of loose hair knots, strands, and stubs were not because it was unclear which fragments had come from which lock. To keep loose hair stubs and knots safe, they were stabilized by stitching onto the net textile. These hair and ribbon fragments were stored in labeled glassine bags and returned to the client. I stabilized the degrading silk ribbons where possible using a solvent set silk crepe lean repair medium made with a three to one Plextol to B500 filtered water. This was tacked in place with low heat from a tacking iron and then reactivated with isopropanol to improve adhesion and reduce shine from the adhesive. After the hair was remounted, I reinforced the sewing of the text block using linen thread and new sewing supports. I added space between the sections while sewing to accommodate the bulk of the hair so that the text block was no longer distorted. <laughs> 
I frayed out the new sewing supports and pasted them onto the boards. The binding was then rebacked with toned Japanese paper and airplane cotton. Overall, the treatment I devised to stabilize and remount the locks of hair in the album seemed to work very well. Stabilizing the hair onto the textile meant that individual hairs were less prone to breakage from mechanical wear, and remounting will help prevent future hair lock loss. Stress sustained by pressure from the sewing thread on the hair was minimized by sewing loosely and with relatively broad stitches, and also by the number of stitches, which diffused the stress over the surface area of the lock. The remounting method ensures that the textile and not the hair will take the strain of attachment. Finally, although aesthetics should never be the primary reason for selecting a treatment, I was pleased that the stabilizing treatment did not negatively impact the way the hair locks looked. A modern day visitor to the Davenport House Museum will have a very similar visual reading experience to Sarah Davenport herself. Next up, I am going to talk to you about the conservation treatments that I performed on a 15th century manuscript on the life of St. Augustine, which is owned by the Boston Public Library. The manuscript was unusual in that it was still bound in a binding nearly as old as the text, and both text block and binding had never been conserved or altered, with the exception of one or two historic paper repairs. Extensive fracturing to the paper underneath the hand-drawn illustrations rendered the manuscript extremely fragile and unable to be used safely without further damage, necessitating conservation. As the most extensively illustrated Vitae Augustini in existence, preserving the illustrations and text was one of the main priorities. Widespread use of a copper-based pigment throughout the volume meant that the paper underneath many of the illustrations was cracked and fragmentary, and the decision on how to repair these cracks was by no means simple. Factoring in the reactivity of copper-based pigments, as well as the need to preserve the aesthetics of the illustrations themselves, the chosen treatment plan would need to neither cause further long-term damage nor negatively impact the experience of future readers and scholars. This manuscript owned by the Boston Public Library likely originated in Spire, Germany, based on the characteristic bull's head watermark shown in the upper right photograph outlined in ink. The text has been dated between 1470 to 1485, and the binding is only a decade or two younger. The printer's waste paste down on the back board indicates that the binding was likely completed around 1494, as the leaf is from a known incunable printed in that year. As I mentioned earlier, this is the most complete Augustinian iconography known to exist, containing 116 hand inked miniatures. The manuscript is not quite complete, chapters 1 to 4 and 22 to 25 are missing, although this seems to have occurred before the text was bound. The narrative is by no means comprehensive, and most text accompanying the miniatures is brief. The manuscript was originally owned by the Order of the Hermit Friars of St. Augustine and was almost certainly created by one of its members. The order was well known for embroidering upon the life of St. Augustine, and this may explain why the manuscript contains a number of scenes from the saint's life that are not found in other accounts. The binding is relatively intact considering its age and has not been rebound or treated previously. The volume is bound in a quarter alum Todd's pigskin over wooden boards binding. The alum Todd skin is lined tooled with floral lozenges in diamond and club shapes. There were losses in the spine material at the head and tail, as well as over the raised cords and also some insect damage to the boards. At one point, the binding had a single clasp at the foredge, but this is now missing. The text block was sewn on three double cords with lightly packed sewing. Paste downs and board attachments consisted of multiple layers of parchment manuscript and paper printer's waste. The board attachments were very secure, and so the binding was still in one piece. The text block consists of five sections of handmade paper by folia sewn through the fold onto double raised cords. The text consists of black ink Gothic cursive with rubrication, 
the illustrations, although plentiful, are fairly rudimentary and there is almost no illumination. Executed in simple blocks of unmodulated red, blue, yellow, black, green, and ochre, the drawings are charming, lively, and humorous. The manuscript is characteristic of those produced after the population, popularization of movable type printing press. Instead of parchment, the manuscript is executed on paper, cursive, is, cursive script is used rather than a formal book hand, and rough pen and ink drawings feature prominently throughout the volume rather than highly detailed illuminated miniatures. The primary point of concern when the Boston Public Library brought the volume to NEDCC was the extensive fracturing of the paper underneath many of the illustrations. The fracturing was presumed to be due to copper ink corrosion, since it only occurred in areas containing green pigments and was particularly prevalent in areas where the green pigment was found on both recto and verso. The fracturing made the leaves very fragile and there were large losses in some heavily affected areas. Even turning the pages carefully, it was observed that the fractured areas were flexing and the edges were abrading each other. So mechanical damage was occurring with every single use. If left untreated, the manuscript would immediately have to be restricted and never accessed again to avoid further damage. Conservation was therefore necessary, but the type and location of the media made treatment difficult to do so safely. Copper-based pigments react negatively to moisture, heat, light, acids, and bases. So the repair method needed to minimize the object's exposure to these agents of deterioration. The aesthetics of the repairs were also a consideration since all of the fractures ran through the illustrations. Because the illustrations were on both recto and verso, the cracks in the paper could not be subtly repaired from behind. The binding was holding together fairly well, and this was largely due to the secure board attachments, unbroken sewing supports, and intact sewing around the raised double cords. However, the sewing was largely broken inside the text block, and some sections were loose. The loose sections had enlarged or torn sewing stations, and many were split or partially split along the spine fold due to mechanical wear. During use, the sections were prone to sawing against the thread, so it was clear that the text block needed to either be re-sewn or have the sewing strengthened to prevent further damage. Re-sewing would have meant the disbinding the volume, but disbinding would destroy historical evidence contained in the sewing and binding structure. Instead, it was decided to reinforce the existing sewing to help stabilize the sections without removing the previous thread or disturbing the binding. After photographing the volume prior to treatment and carefully documenting its condition, the text block was surface cleaned only in areas containing no media. The surface dirt was for the most part heavily ingrained and so cleaning did not appear to make much of a difference. The media was tested for friability. While most of the media was fairly stable, the carbon black pigmented areas were friable. There were cracks, in these most heavily pigmented areas and some of the black media was flaking away. These areas were consolidated with ethanol and triphenory. Th this consolidant was selected because it has a matte appearance when dry and so would not negatively affect the matte appearance of the carbon-based media. The cracked areas of paper underneath the illustrations were repaired using a fine fiber stitch technique developed by conservators at the British Library to repair tears in a copper corroded Mercator Atlas. This technique uses individual Kozo fibers from blended Japanese paper to place almost invisible bridges over tears using a minute amount of very dry wheat starch paste. The repair resembles stitches, hence the name, but does not actually go through the paper, and it uses an infinitesimally small amount of moisture, so it limits the potential damage to the copper media. Because the repairs were nearly invisible, this treatment could also safely be employed over the illustrations without negatively changing the aesthetic impact of the drawings. To prepare the fibers, RK27 Japanese Kozo paper was soaked in filtered water 
then blended until the paper or until the fiber is separated. The fibers tended to form clumps in the blender, so the fibers were separated and combed so that they were all mm -hmm. oriented in the same direction. The combed fibers were dried and then trimmed into smaller segments, approximately five millimeters in length. Once dry, these fibers could be stored indefinitely until needed. Prior to making repairs, the fibers were rehydrated using a drop of filtered water. They were then teased apart using tweezers and a microspatula. To perform repairs, a single COZO fiber was picked up using pointed tip tweezers and trimmed with scissors to approximately two to three millimeters in length. This additional trimming was necessary to ensure that the fibers were consistent in length and also to minimize the visual impact of the repair. The fiber was then dipped into a dry wheat starch paste and then the fiber was blotted onto a ceramic tile to remove excess moisture. After blotting, the trimmed COZO fiber was applied to the fractured paper, laying the fiber across the breakage. After the fiber was aligned properly, it was very gently tamped down using a micro spatula, and then it was placed under a bondina and blotter packet to dry. Light pressure was applied over the mend, either with a fingertip pressure or a small glass weight. Because so very little moisture is used in this repair method, the mend dries very quickly. It was necessary to work quickly as it pause or delay in putting the fiber down once it had been dipped into the wheat starch paste could result in the adhesive drying to the point where the mend was ineffective. Once the mends were dry, the process was repeated as necessary, spacing the COZO fibers approximately 1 to 1.5 millimeters apart. The bridges were placed along the entire length of the crack and on both recto and verso to avoid tenting. And here is a side-by-side -side comparison of the cracks in one of the illustrations both before and after mending. As you can see from the before photograph on the left, the cracks were causing the paper to flex and mechanical wear from this flexion had resulted in small losses. After conservation, this seesawing motion no longer occurred and the risk of loss was minimized. The repairs are nearly invisible. When viewed from head on, they can only be seen under a microscope. They're a little bit more apparent under raking light as seen here. And even then our photographer has boosted the image contrast so that you, the audience can see the repairs. Several text leaves had large losses. The paper surrounding the losses was brittle and was at immediate risk of further loss if the pages flexed during reading or if the jagged loss edges caught on adjacent leaves. Gampu paper was chosen for the fill pieces because it was fairly lightweight, yet opaque, and so would have a sympathetic appearance to the paper of the text block, and would not be too heavy or inflexible. Additionally, Gampu paper tends to feather with shorter fibers than Kozo, so it was ideal for this particular type of fill, where the fibers needed to overlap the illustration as little as possible. The curators were given the choice between leaving the fill paper as is, meaning that it would be a light cream color, not dissimilar to the paper of the text block, but immediately visible in the context of the illustrations, or having the fill paper toned to a sympathetic green color so that it would blend into the background of the illustration. After careful consideration and discussion, the client opted for the untoned Japanese paper fills, both to minimize the introduction of outside materials and to make it immediately obvious to the viewer that this was a repair and not part of the original material. To create the fill pieces, the outline of the loss was traced onto a piece of Melanex. A needle tool was used to score a medium weight Japanese gampi paper along the outlines of the loss. And then the paper was torn along the score line so that the fill piece had a lightly feathered edge. The fill piece was checked against the outline of the loss to make sure that it was neither too large nor too small, and then the fill piece was adhered over the loss area with a very dry wheat starch paste. Filling the losses prevented the paper from unnecessary flexing, and the feathered edges of the fill piece acted similarly to the fine fiber stitch repairs, meaning that the fragile loss edges were no longer in danger of breakage. <laughs> 
Because only a small amount of gumpy fibers from the feathered fill pieces extended onto the illustrations, it minimized the introduction of moisture and avoided obscuring the art. Once the fracturing and losses were mended, the rest of the text block could be repaired. Mending tears and filling losses along the edges of the text block was very straightforward, requiring only local humidification to unfurl the creases and folds and basic repairs with Japanese paper and a dry wheat starch paste. In areas where the paper was cockled, fills and mends were shaped during drying to follow the undulation of the rest of the text block. Guarding the spine folds in situ was a little bit more complicated. Although the text block only contained five sections, adding guards could introduce additional swell at the spine and place strain on the alum Todd skin. This could risk splitting the spine material or board attachments. So a lighter weight Japanese tissue was used during guarding to reduce the amount of bulk. It was too messy and difficult to paste up the Japanese paper and then insert it between bifolia. The paper was too floppy and fragile to be pushed through with tweezers when pasted, and the paste could potentially transfer to areas where it shouldn't be. Instead, slips of Japanese Koza paper were inserted between the bifolia, the adjacent paper was masked off using Melanex, and then wheat starch paste was applied to the repair tissue. The repair tissue was then wrapped around the spine fold. The pasting out piece of Melanex was removed with a layer of, and then a layer of Bondino was placed between the bifolia to prevent them from adhering together. The newly applied guard was dried by sandwiching the repaired area between Bondina and blotter packets and gentle pressure was applied with a bone folder until dry. This resulted in a guard that was nearly invisible, did not distort or discolor the surrounding paper, and did not require disbinding the text block. Two of the leaves were fully detached from the text block and so were guarded back onto the appropriate sections as shown here on the left. To the right is a comparison of the spine folds before and after guarding. In the top photograph, you can see that the spine folds are torn and ragged and in the bottom after conservation, they're much more stable. Be because the original sewing was not removed, many of the guards were individually placed between sewing stations to avoid placing the tissue repairs on top of the previous thread. After the sections were guarded and the torn sewing stations mended, the original sewing was reinforced using a linen thread similar in appearance to the previous thread. A slightly thinner thread than the original was selected in hopes of keeping additional swell to a minimum. The sewing was reinforced around the previous thread using the same sewing stations and sewing style. As the previous sewing was only loosely packed, it was possible to, to place the new thread between the old thread when wrapping it around the raised cords. Since the alum Todd skin was missing over the raised cord areas, there was no need to disbind or lift any spine material to gain access to these areas. It was nevertheless a delicate process since the volume could not be safely opened to 180 degrees and inserting the needle into some of the sewing stations could be difficult. The new sewing complements the appearance of the previous sewing, but slight differences in hue and thickness make it possible to distinguish between the two. These obvious visual differences will make it possible for scholars to differentiate between new and original materials in future studies of the volume. The previous sewing was loose and broken within the text block, unsightly and also prone to tangling. The loose thread was laid over the new sewing and adhered in place using small amounts of dry wheat starch paste. This creates the appearance of the original sewing and holds the loose threads in place, but is also easily reversible if needed. The spine material had losses, but was relatively stable otherwise. The decision was made to not fill the losses in the alum Todd skin in order to avoid introducing new materials and adhesive unless absolutely necessary. Only one small split along the spine was reinforced with alum Todd skin and Lascaux 498 HV adhesive, since there was concern that this could split further if not stabilized. <laughs> 
Overall, this treatment successfully stabilized the text leaves and binding while minimizing visual impact of their repairs. The volume is now able to be accessed again, albeit with gentle handling, instead of being strictly off limits. The volume was also digitized after conservation and is now available worldwide on the Digital Commonwealth at the link shown here. Finally, I'm gonna conclude this presentation by talking about the conservation and digitization process of this Kashmiri Birchmark manuscript from Chapin Library's special collections. When this manuscript came to NEDCC, it was extremely fragile and functionally unusable since it wasn't safe to handle. The pages were delaminating and splitting horizontally. As you can imagine, the bark was pretty brittle and many parts of the manuscript had broken off resulting in sections of text being lost. Some leaves were also crumpled, which meant that the text was hidden in the creases and folds. Most, but not all of this damage was concentrated at the front and the back of the book, where it got the heaviest amount of wear. Conservation was very necessary to help prevent further loss and damage, but access was also a driving force. The splits and creases in each of the leaves tended to get tangled up with each other, effectively blocking off the center of the book from access. In order to safely read beyond the first section, conservation treatments needed to untangle the frayed bark edges and mend them so that they wouldn't be able to snag on each other again. Before I started to treat the manuscript, I needed to understand how birch bark manuscripts worked. From the Himalayan birch trees, bark from the Himalayan birch trees was used often for writing support in the Kashmir region prior to the use of paper. However, it is a material that I had never worked with before, at least from a conservation perspective. So I had to do a lot of research before starting on the treatment. The text block of the manuscript consists of leaves of two to four layers of birch bark held together with both artificial and natural laminates. Artificial laminates were adhered by the creator of the text block using a weak unknown adhesive that was probably derived from plant materials. Natural laminates are two plus layers of birch bark that came directly off the tree in that configuration. These layers are naturally adhered together on the tree with pectin, which is a weak adhesive found in many plants. Lenticels, which are those narrow oval shaped pores that you find on birch trees, extend through multiple layers of the birch bark, which also adhere them together. The lenticel patterns on birch trees are very unique, and this helps identify which layers on any given manuscript leaf are natural laminates and which aren't by seeing which layers have matching lenticels. The common theme here is that both types of adhesive in the bark laminates was very weak, which caused them to peel apart over time. Furthermore, the lenticels are very acidic, brittle, and full of lignin, so they are prone to breakage over time. The Kashmiri binding, manuscript binding style is also very distinct and quite different from the Western and Islamic manuscripts that I've worked on previously. So I made a model of this birch bark manuscript before beginning treatment to help me better understand the binding structure. Unfortunately, there are very few resources in English anyway, describing the Kashmiri book binding process. So I had to rely upon what I could see on the binding itself. The binding was missing, but luckily there were digitized versions of other Kashmiri manuscripts that I could use to come up with as a reasonable approximation. While the original manuscript was made with birch bark, it is very hard to get a hold of enough Himalayan birch bark in the correct size and thickness to bind a new text block with it. Instead, I used papyrus for the text block since it is also made of a relatively unprocessed plant material and has similar working properties because it is also somewhat brittle and made of several laminated layers. The text block of Kashmiri style bindings is sewn together using only two sewing stations using an unsupported link stitch. A relatively thick cord is used to sew the text block and the sections have little notches cut out at the sewing stations so that the cord can nestle into this recess after sewing. The cord itself is tied off and looped and twisted around itself at the end. I couldn't find any information about why this is done, but I'm guessing it was done to help secure the knot a little better, since knots in thicker cords like this tend to come unknotted more easily than with thread. <laughs> 
Birch bark manuscripts have very unique end bands and the cores are made from wood whittled to have knobs at the ends and a recessed area. The recessed area and raised knobs help keep the end bands sewing from sliding off the edges of the wooden core. The end bands are sewn with the primary sewing using a cord that is the same thickness as the one used on the text block. A textile wrapper that functions as, as a spine lining is sewn onto the text block at the same time. This end band is not merely decorative, but also serves a significant structural purpose. Since the text block is only sewn at two sewing stations, the sections are prone to slipping and sliding around. Integrating the linen spine lining into the end band sewing provides additional anchors at the text and uh, the text head and tail to help solidify the text block and prevent it from seesawing during use. This birch bark manuscript is constructed without the use of adhesive the way a European or Islamic manuscript might have been bound. So this additional structural support is essential to the book's structural integrity. I'd also like to note that I had to use a small amount of conjecture when sewing the end band cores to the binding, since I couldn't see underneath the leather spine lining. I've used an end band sewing with a back bead, which is very common on European books during the time period when end bands were still hand sewn. But it's entirely possible that this Kashmiri end band was sewn without the back bead. The final step in the model making process was to create a limp leather binding in the Kashmiri envelope binding style. The binding consists of a leather spine lining that wraps up and over the tops of the end bands before doubling back underneath itself and a limp goatskin binding with a four edge flap and envelope style enclosure. The leather spine lining and binding are sewn onto the text block, not adhered, and this is done by sewing with a saddle stitch underneath the end bands. The textile wrapper was left loose because I couldn't find enough information to determine whether it might have served as a paste down on the limp leather binding or if it had some other purpose. And here is the finished product. While we don't usually do binding models for every book that we work on at NEDCC, this was a really important step in this manuscript's treatment. Since it allowed me to spend a dedicated chunk of time thinking about the book and how it functioned and to do as much, much research as possible in preparation for working on the real thing. Even though I wasn't going to be doing any binding repairs, it was still important for me to think about how the book worked as a whole. It was also important for me to be mindful about my own experience, or in this case, my lack thereof, of cashmere bind or Kashmiri bindings that I didn't make erroneous assumptions about the structure based on my knowledge of European and Islamic bindings. After finishing the book model, I began treating the manuscript. As I go through the process, you'll notice that the binding and sewing aren't being treated. This is because they were both relatively stable without intervention and didn't actively need treatment. Furthermore, repairing the binding and adding new leather covers would have been a majorly invasive process and would probably have meant that the book needed to be disbound or new material adhered to this bind. Kashmiri birch bark manuscripts are so rare. So it was felt that treat, like any performing any intervention on the bindings would have been unethical since the treatment process would result in the structure being irreversibly altered. Since it was stable as is, it was an easy choice to select a more minimally invasive treatment. The only part of the binding that was treated was the textile wrapper, which was crumpled and creased. This was humidified and flattened using local humidification. I used a moisture reserve, in this case, cotton rag blotter saturated with filtered water and a layer of Gore-Tex to deliver humidification in a very gentle and controlled way. To prevent humidification from spreading to other areas of the text block, I masked off any areas that needed to stay dry with mylar. As you can see, the textile ended up laying almost completely flat after treatment. Most of the text block was relatively clean and didn't require surface cleaning. However, some loose fragments had dirt and mud heavily caked onto the surface, making it impossible to read the text underneath. Some of this dirt I was able to clean with soft sponges or a soft brush, but some mud deposits needed to be gently chipped away with a microspatula.
As I mentioned before, there were a lot of places in the text block where the birch bark was delaminating or where there were horizontal splits in the birch bark. A lot of the splits occurred near the sewing stations or at the edges of the text block. Luckily, the laminate structure of the leaves was very convenient for making repairs. Instead of applying a mend to the surface of the page, I was able to insert mends between the layers of the birch bark, making them nearly invisible once the mends were complete. This was a very delicate and fiddly process since it was difficult to insert the repair tissue between the layers, especially when the splits were hard in hard to access areas like the spine. While normally wheat starch paste is the adhesive of choice for Japanese paper mends, I used a methyl cellulose gel to adhere the mends in this manuscript. This was done for a couple of reasons. Methyl cellulose is a weaker adhesive than wheat starch paste, and it's always best to select a weaker repair material than the objects you are working on. That way, if the object is placed under mechanical stress of some sort, the repair will fail, leaving the original material protected. Methyl cellulose is also more flexible than paste, which is very beneficial in a brittle object. And it's also a cellulose derivative. So chemically, it's more similar to birch bark than say wheat starch paste. Finally, methyl cellulose is less prone to contracting when it dries, unlike wheat starch paste. So it is less likely to cockle as it dries. I applied the methyl cellulose gel between the layers brushing it over the previously inserted paper slips. It was easier to do it this way instead of applying the gel to the paper and then trying to take a wet, fragile piece of tissue and attempt to insert it between the birch bark layers without tearing it or getting gel on the surface of the manuscript. After I applied the gel, I gently rolled a cotton swab over the surface of the birch bark to help consolidate the layers. The mends were then dried under Holytex and blotters to avoid distortion. As you can see, this method of repair was nearly invisible. Performing these mends meant that the splits in the pages were no longer getting worse with use and prevented the torn edges from sawing or flexing against each other. Sometimes entire leaves were delaminated. Surprisingly, these pages were the easiest to work on since I didn't need to painstakingly weave slips of paper between layers. Instead, I could complete mends like they were surface mends and these would then be covered up when the layers were relaminated. Relaminating the delaminated layers was relatively straightforward. I simply brushed methyl cellulose onto the surface of the interior layers, making sure to unfold any creased areas before laying the next layer down. These pages were dried under gentle weight with Holytex and blotter. It took much longer to dry the whole page relamination since they involved a proportionately higher amount of moisture. Some leaves were so creased and crumpled that it took a considerable amount of work to unfurl and repair the damage. Teasing apart these two fragments and mending the splits, humidifying the creases and figuring out which loose pieces could be reattached was a puzzle that took several days to solve in this instance. And I'm just gonna show you a fun video, um, time-lapse of the conservation of one page of the manuscript. Uh, this is about an hour and a half's worth of work condensed down into half a minute. Um, and as you can see, I'm just working in stages and uh, kind of working on one area, letting it dry, going on to work on a different area um, and gradually piecing the page back together. And then after conservation happened, uh, our imaging services department digitized it. While a lot of commercial digitization of books is done with scanners, all imaging at NADCC is done manually, page by page, and with a lot of attention paid to even the most minute details. There's a lot of planning and hard work that goes into each individual photograph, and every single image is quality checked to make sure that everything is in focus and that the image is an accurate representation of the object. The first part of the digitization process is, the setup, is to set up the manuscript on the imaging station. The Birchmark manuscript was imaged on our XY table, which is our largest station. 
This setup is normally used for oversized objects because the table is huge and can move in several directions on an XY axis. The camera takes several images of the work and then they can be digitally stitched together. The Birchmark manuscript is relatively small in comparison to what usually gets imaged on the XY table. But the relatively large amount of table space meant that more people were able to assist in the manuscript's digitization. In these photographs, the photographer is setting up the table for the manuscript using foam wedges, a mat board cradle, and black velvet over the top to provide a neutral background. The manuscript needs to be well supported during the imaging process, and the book support needs will change as the, the photographer, Meredith Moore, goes through the text block so that the wedges are adjusted many times throughout. Once the manuscript is set up in the cradle, the focus is rechecked. The manuscript needed to be supported from underneath with small supports to get the surface parallel to the table. In the photograph on the right, you can see a dog tag tangling, dangling from a chain. The chain is set to a specific length and hung from the top of the camera. This allows the photographers to check that the height of the camera is the correct distance from the surface of the manuscript. As the pages are turned, the book's depth changes minutely and the chain allows the photographer to check the height during the process and make adjustments as needed. The manuscript isn't completely flat, so the camera's focus is always checked in multiple places to make sure that the image is capturing everything. Many of the pages were able to be captured by just one photographer, but there were some page stubs that with text on them at the front and the back of the manuscript that were very difficult to reach because they weren't able to lie flat on their own. As you can see on the bottom left photo, this required up to four people, two to manually hold the fragments in place, or uh, as the bottom right photo, you can see there are five hands in that photo. Um, there was one person who had to adjust the camera height and one to take the photo and make sure that the fragments were being held down at the correct height and in the right configuration. The binding was also imaged and this required a different camera setup with a black velvet backdrop. As you can see in the bottom right photograph, the photographer again checks the camera's distance from the manuscript to make sure that it is consistent. And here is what the spine and the foredge of the binding look like after digitization. A lot of hard work went into making sure that all parts of the photo were in focus a much more difficult process because it requires a greater depth of field than if the book were imaged flat or top down. Getting the lighting right was also really important because of the uneven and cockled edges of the book had the potential to create shadows and obscure information. The manuscript's treatment um, was not quite finished until after digitization because the uh, images had to be sent to scholars that were familiar with the Sharda script, um, and they took these loose fragments and they identified the text. Um, in some cases, uh, these loose fragments were then able to be reunited with parts of the text um, where they'd uh, gone missing from, because the scholar was able to say, you know, this is a you know definite piece that came here. And in some cases, they were not able to be reattached because they were free floating fragments that we could tell approximately where they came from. Um, and so those were then uh, mounted into um, uh, an encapsulated post binding. And so those will correspond to uh, the images that the photographer took. Um, and so they can be viewed recto and verso and uh, just really nice way for scholars to access the loose fragments. Um, and that just about wraps things up. Um, I'm now going to open the floor for any questions that people might have. Um, this PowerPoint, as I said before, will be made available after uh, the presentation ends, um, so you can have these slides for reference. Um, yeah, thank you so much for uh, attending today. It's been great talking to you all. I have a quick question, if you don't mind, sure. Mary. Um, I do e-textiles, and you got me thinking because I had picked up some copper wire. Mm -hmm. Now I'm thinking that that's maybe not such a great type of wire to be using on textiles if you hope for yeah, them. It, you know, 
Yeah, I mean, I think it, it depends on what you'd like to use them for. Um, and, you know, I think if you're using it for sort of modern materials and it, you're creating a new work of art, then there's a certain amount of inherent vice to be had in the materials. Um, and I know artists, um, you know, their, their priority is not always longevity. So, you know, it's, it's kind of an interesting ethical question. Um, there may be a copper, like copper wire that is perhaps coated with something um, that could kind of mitigate the effects of the corrosion. Um, so that's a possibility to look into. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Beautiful work that you've done. Thank you. Thank you so much. These were just really incredible objects to work on. And I, I feel so lucky that I, I had the privilege of working on them. Um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, that's one of the wonderful things about working for any DCC is you just get so many incredible things that come through the door, you know, mm -hmm. just really, really stunning. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a question coming in on the chat uh, asking me about the textual const contents of the Kashmiri manuscript. Um, I only know a little bit about that. And so it was a grammatical text uh, of what I'm not sure. Um, the scholar uh, in Germany who was analyzing the text could say more about that. Um, it's still ongoing. Um, and I think one important thing to note is that before the text came to NDCC, like it wasn't, the book wasn't able to be opened. So they weren't actually able to read it beforehand. Um, mm -hmm. So it's only pretty recently that they've been able to access the material inside. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I've got a question, a question coming in from Stephanie. Uh, how do you describe, or can you describe what is meant by a dry wheat starch paste? It looked very liquidy in the image showing you dipping the individual, individual fibers in it. Um, so that's, that's a really good question. And dry in this case is relative. Um, usually when you're doing a paste and paper mend, uh, the adhesive the research paste is diluted a lot more, um, sort of kind of the consistency of skim milk, I've always heard it described as. And in this case, it was more uh, gel-like, I guess I would say. And it was a really delicate balance um, with the surface tension. So in an ideal world, I would have used the driest paste possible. But if the paste was too dry, then every time I tried to dip the COZO fiber into it, it bounced off the surface. Um, so there was definitely some um, playing around with trying to figure out what worked best. Um, I think the overall ratio was like a one to seven um, water to paste ratio. And it also, I mean, it was movable as a target throughout the day because especially in the winter, um, stuff dries out a lot quicker. Um, and so I had to add moisture to kind of rehydrate the paste. Okay, if there are no more questions, I will wrap things up. Um, if you do think of something later, uh, my contact email is mfrench at bpl.org. Um, and you're welcome to email me any follow-up questions you might have. Uh, it was so wonderful talking to you all today. And thank you so much.